científico de la Universidad de Loma Linda de California. Es autor de muchos artículos en relación, muchos de ellos, a la utilidad de la ecografía o el papel de la ecografía en la vigilancia y el screening. Y entre sus líneas de investigación pues, está la mejora de la asistencia sanitaria en hepatología y trasplante hepático, y así como la toma también de decisiones sobre la calidad de los órganos. Sin más, para no comerle más tiempo, Michael, el doctor, cuando quiera. Gracias. Ok, la última presentación, no se preocupe, es muy corta. Lo siento que necesito hablar en inglés. So, uh, briefly, we'll discuss the epidemiology of hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, talk about when to screen and how to screen and who to screen, and then we'll discuss strategies for improving the effectiveness of surveillance programs. Um, the worldwide incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma varies by uh, geographic location. You can see Spain and the United States are both uh, intermediate areas of incidence. At uh, ranging from three to 30 per 100,000 uh, people. In the United States, and uh, similarly, I, I suspect in Spain, a viral hepatitis causes most hepatocellular carcinoma. You can see here that um, about half in the US is related to hepatitis C, um, and then another third uh, from uh, either uh, hepatitis B or combination. Uh, Non-alcoholic non fatty liver disease is a rising cause of hepatocellular carcinoma in the United States. Other risk factors uh, include age, alcohol, uh, tobacco, hemochromatosis, and uh, diabetes or the metabolic syndrome. I want to clarify terminology, uh, the difference between screening and surveillance. Screening is uh, a one-time test. Surveillance is repeated testing over time. And we'll use those terms interchangeably, but um, uh, usually when you're talking about a um, long-term program, that's surveillance. So, uh, criteria in general for screening of any disease um, is that the disease must be common in the population you're studying. Tests exist which can identify pre-symptomatic disease. Uh, treatment exists which will change the natural history of the disease. Uh, and we know from uh, two randomized trials that surveillance for hepatocellular carcinoma reduces mortality. Um, this is just one of them. These trials have been criticized because of methodological flaws, but if you look carefully at those flaws, most of those would bias towards the null hypothesis. So who to screen? Um, in general, the recommendation is to screen uh, patients with greater than 1% per year probability of hepatocellular carcinoma. So patients with cirrhosis of any cause, have about a one to three percent risk per year. Older patients with chronic hepatitis B, about 1.5 percent risk. Importantly, uh, patients with non-serotic hepatitis C, particularly those with early stage fibrosis, uh, have far less than a one percent risk and therefore are not recommended to be screened. Additionally, it's important to identify uh, candidates who would be able to receive life-prolonging treatment. Uh, so uh, patients with child C cirrhosis who are not candidates for transplantation, really there's not much you could do if you identify uh, or diagnose the HCC. Additionally, patients with advanced comorbidities, such as heart failure, uh, advanced lung disease, are not really candidates for life-prolonging treatment. How often to screen? Uh, the six months was originally chosen based on the mean doubling time of the tumor. Um, there's an interesting randomized trial comparing three months versus six months and found no benefit of the shorter interval. Uh, so six months is still the recommended standard. Now what test to use? Um, undoubtedly, uh, in the ideal world, every patient would get an MRI every six months um, this would be more effective. However, uh, it's 
extraordinarily expensive. Um, if we did that for every patient with cirrhosis in the United States, it would cost over $2 billion per year. Um, CT scan is associated with unacceptably high radiation exposure. Um, it, as, many, as few as 400 CAT CT scans uh, would actually cause cancer. So if we did that routinely in our population, we would be harming patients probably more than helping them. Uh, important that a single ultrasound is not very sensitive or specific, but a, a program of serial ultrasounds over time does improve the test performance. Um, this program is able to detect 94% of preclinical HCC and 63% of early HCC, so those within Milan criteria. The incremental value of alpha fetal protein is small. It detects an additional 10 to 20 percent of cases at the cost of false positives. So that's why the current guidelines recommend ultrasound plus minus the use of alpha fetal protein. I think most of us do still use AFP and do find it to be helpful, but it's important to recognize its limitations. Now what about other biomarkers? There's been a very large number of studies uh, looking at other biomarkers uh, such as AFPL3, DCP. Um, thus far, these appear to be inferior to AFP, and they tend to trade sensitivity for specificity and often identify more advanced cases. Um, there's the full discussion of all the various biomarkers is beyond the scope of this talk, so I won't get into it, but the bottom line is that they're still experimental at this point. Now, one important point is that um, even if we are able to develop better tests, we would not have much of an impact unless we actually improve the frequency with which patients receive surveillance. Uh, various studies have shown that, at least in the United States, uh, fewer than one-third of patients uh, who are candidates for surveillance actually receive it. Uh, and uh, we, we showed uh, that patient education is associated with the likelihood of receipt of surveillance. So one way to improve the effectiveness, um, even if we can't improve the test's quality, uh, we can just improve adherence. Um, in our practice, we uh, created automated protocols. So rather than relying on the physician to remember uh, to order the ultrasound when he or she is seeing the patient in clinic. Um, we created protocols such that every six months a reminder pops up and the nurse will send out the order. Um, physician doesn't really have to do anything. And that's because when we're seeing these patients in clinic, we're dealing with their ascites, uh, trying to get them to transplant, dealing with all of their aches and pains and various other complaints, and quite frankly, we run out of time or forget. And we showed that this improved our rates of surveillance from 74% to 94%. Another way to improve adherence is to target primary care. Um, in the United States, fewer than half of patients with cirrhosis are seen by a, a hepatologist uh, or even a gastroenterologist. Uh, and there was an interesting study this past year showing that computer reminders to primary care can improve adherence. A second way to improve the effectiveness of the current test is to improve ultrasound operator technique. Um, in our practice, we use a dedicated ultrasonographer, and uh, we make sure to list the indication on the order, um, because oftentimes, the ultrasonographer will receive an order for an ultrasound that just says um, uh, ultrasound, abdominal ultrasound, without clear indication. And so they may not really realize or focus on uh, what they should be looking for, which are often really subtle uh, hypoechoic nodules in the liver. Um, we also provide feedback for missed cases. Um, in other words, when the patient develops a symptomatic HCC, and it turns out this was missed on a recent ultrasound, we'll notify the ultrasonographer uh, and have them go back and look at it to see if they could have detected it. 
Now, this is just anecdotal. I think that someone really needs to do this study, um, but uh, that's based on our clinical experience. A third way to improve effectiveness of the current tests is to utilize patterns over time. We noticed in our clinical practice that um, some patients would have a gradual rise, which of course would cause concern. We also know some patients really bounce around. The AFP is high one, one time, a low the next time. doesn't seem to correspond to their hepatitis C viral load or any other clinical factor that we could tell. Um, and so we looked at this in a study, and we found that certainly the rate of rise was associated with the risk of uh, developing liver cancer. So even if you say the cutoff is 20 nanograms per milliliter, if there is an increase from 7 to, say, 18, this should prompt further testing. Uh, furthermore, we also found that the fluctuation was an independent predictor of development of hepatocellular carcinoma. So those patients that have lots of fluctuations uh, that may represent a cycle of cell death and um, repair that causes hepatocarcinogenesis. A final way to improve the effectiveness of current tests is to target resources at the highest risk patients. So current guidelines recommend screening all patients with cirrhosis, but within that group, there's actually a wide range of risk uh, based on age, etiology of liver disease, platelet count, and patients can be categorized into a high risk group. Uh, their risk is 30% at five years versus the low-risk group, whose risk is only 2% at five years. Um, so this has not been prospectively studied, but I would hypothesize that we could identify more cases by uh, actually targeting this, the uh, resources to the high-risk group. And maybe the low-risk groups, we shouldn't be doing anything, whereas the high-risk groups, perhaps we should even be doing a once-a-year MRI. And I know lots of... Uh, Physicians currently do this in practice, but again, this requires prospective study. So um, in summary, uh, HCC surveillance should be done in patients with cirrhosis and older non cirrhotics with hepatitis B. Uh, the current tests remain the same as they have been for years, ultrasound every six months, plus or minus alpha fetal protein. However, despite the fact that the tests have not changed, there are ways uh, where, by which the effectiveness of these tests can be approved uh, in clinical practice. Thank you.